Okay, let's do this. Look at this approaching 1 million views. Crazy! Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio, or good morning. It's uh, morning here on the west coast of Canada, and it is Canada Day. So we're going to be looking at an artist who was not born in Canada, but is seen by some as being a kind of an, a Canadian artist. So we're going to look at the art of Peter Doig today. Peter Doig is, is one of my favorite artists, and I'm not going out on a limb there because he's um, one of if not the most uh, successful, at least from a financial perspective, or at least his paintings have sold a lot of money. Maybe he hasn't gotten the proceeds of a lot of that, um, but as well as being one of the most influential artists of our time. And Peter Doig uh, has done a lot of incredible artwork. This is one of his most famous paintings, and I think one of the most achievable paintings for us to do that some of the other ones which we'll take a look at here in a moment are, are much denser more complex um, that that I even I might like even a little bit more but I think this is something that we can do within a reasonable amount of time on a holiday day so let's take a look at the plan for today's episode we are gonna start with getting the image onto the canvas using the template that is provided to you for free. And then we're gonna stain the canvas with a little bit of color. Whoa. Uh, and uh, <laughs> then we're gonna talk a little bit about Peter Doig and his biography. Then we'll get the painting started. I don't think we need to do any underpainting. We'll go right into the background and foreground and so on and so forth and in about two and a half hours we'll do a little side-by-side -side comparison to see how things turned out and if you're watching the video long after it was recorded or even 10 minutes after it was recorded you can use the the time stamped chapters uh, to jump forward to wherever you want to go so if you want to skip all of what i'm talking about right now go right ahead skip it uh, as always, if you want to support the channel, consider liking, subscribing, hitting that notification bell so you know when new videos are coming. Sometimes, like today, I'm doing a spontaneous stream that isn't really announced more than about an hour beforehand. Notification bell is your guide. As well, if you want to leave a donation of as little as a dollar, price of a cup of coffee for what you're learning today, consider leaving a donation. You can use the PayPal. There's a link to that. There's a super chat function there. I see Paula use that just yesterday. You can, if you see a little dollar sign where you enter a comment, you can leave a um, small donation there, or you can contact me through the Facebook or the, the website, etc. In fact, let me just uh, remind you that once a month, I go through our private Facebook group here, collect all the work, organize it, and do a special feedback episode where I give people some uh, suggestions on how to improve their artwork and I strongly encourage you to join that group take a photograph of the painting you made today and upload it to the group so that we can celebrate your achievement and if you're not that confident in it and you think it could be better even better reason I hear people saying all the time it's not that good I don't want to post it it's like well how are you ever gonna get better if you don't get any feedback right anyway I digress let's move right into the next chapter here and we'll talk about this uh, as we go so our first step is to get this image onto the canvas and this image that uh, an outline that I've done can be found in a Dropbox folder in the description below and you're gonna see at the very very top these are our most simple very introductory like how to mix a color wheel episodes these are very simple paintings that I think uh, even a very, very beginner painter could do. Arguably, today's painting is, it would fall along those lines as well. Um, but I have put it right here. Folder number 122, right between Warhol and Picasso is Peter Doig. You click in 122, and you're going to see the three files in here. There's the original image itself. Actually, I've extended the top and the bottom. We'll talk about that a little bit later. 
um, as well as the outline, which is both a JPEG and a PDF, whatever is easier for you to print out. So let's do this. Let's get going. So to do this uh, kind of image transfer, once you've got your template printed out, we are going to put it onto a nine by 12 sized canvas board, right? If you wanna get this exact one, there's a link to the an Amazon page there and you can buy this. I like these ones, they come out, you can you buy like 20, 12 of them for 25 bucks or something like that, $24. So it comes out to $2 a canvas, which is twice as much as the ones you get at the dollar store, but I think they're four times as good, so. Uh, so then I'm just going to tape this down. W one thing I like about using like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and putting it on here is I got this little nice little edge and that gives me an opportunity to tape something down. Okay, next step, I'm going to use some carbon transfer paper and you can get this at your, depending on your local dollar store, your art supply store, of course, there is a link to buying this stuff from Amazon in the description below as well. Uh, and of course, you can also find them at your, um, like a fabric store, because that's how people transfer. Um, pe people use carbon paper to transfer images onto, f or patterns onto fabric, right? So, usually, actually, I was going to say, usually I measure just to make sure. Okay, seven and a half centimeters, seven and a half centimeters it is after all Canada day so we're going to use the metric system <laughs> when measuring um, and I'm going to do this pretty quickly I'm not going to do a lot of these other lines here and the reason I do all of those other lines in the drawing is just so that the drawing itself kind of looks cool if people want to color in just with pencil crayons and not do the whole painting thing then you have that option you got the whole thing there and I also, I do think that those lines just help reinforce maybe the brush strokes that we might see in this painting. In fact, I might just do a little bit of that. And... We'll talk all about the story behind this image, where this figure appears from, and, and maybe why he chose it, and uh, as you know, after we get this painting started, and uh, almost done this here. So let's just do a double check. That looks pretty good. Right, so you can see there's not, a, a, I'm not bothering to do most of the details on there because they're not necessary. Okay, I like to keep these. I actually often keep it just out of view here so that if I want to refer to it, especially once paint starts to kind of accumulate on the canvas, it's nice to have something to refer to. I feel like my, it's still early in the morning. My voice seems a little bit, bit groggy. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to the next step. Sip of tea. Ah! Sorry, I know that's loud. Okay, the um, next step here. Oh, and I'm out of focus. Interesting. Give me one second.
that's better. That's better. Seems like it's always in focus, and then one day it's out of focus. Okay, so the next step here is to do um, the imprematura, which is to stain the canvas. This is an old technique that artists have been using for 600 plus years, going all the way back to before Leonardo da Vinci. So we're going to apply this on here, and it's interesting because Peter Doig has done used lots of different colors for this next step. I, I don't think we're going to do that today because I don't think he did it in this painting, but it is something just to kind of think about that, that he's probably mo more so than anyone that I can think of kind of popularized the idea of using um, unconventional colors for this particular step. And I think we'll see some of those when we look in his biography um, shortly here. So, oops, that's for later. <laughs> Let's do this first. That's a lot of yellow, but that's okay, actually, now that I think about it. So now I'm going to put a little bit of water on here. So you got a bit of water on the canvas, that's okay, because we're about to paint right into it. So it's okay, it's a little bit wet. This is the only time I ever put water on my painting or use water in my acrylic all right and that water that I splashed on there is gone I always really like getting the edges of the canvas. I always think, you know, when I go to a museum and I look at paintings, that's one of the things I'm, I look at is like, how did the artist treat the edge of the painting? Were they thinking about it at all? Or did they just cover it up with a frame? You know, uh, maybe 150 years ago, or even less, up, up until maybe 100 years ago, most of the time, artists didn't really think about the edge of the picture because you normally would have your painting framed if it was on a panel of, of any kind or a canvas. Um, and prior to that, a lot of it would be on walls and ceilings, right? So, um, but over the past hundred years, a lot of artists have deliberately made paintings that are not intended to be framed or like someone like Pierre Mondrian or Francis Bacon, they made their own frames or had them custom made specifically for their own artwork. And uh, so they really started thinking about the painting as a kind of object in and of itself, which, you know, I had teachers in school who said that that's like, you shouldn't treat painting as an object or a sculpture, it's, it's an image. And then other people who felt very differently It's, uh, I find those things just very fascinating to think about the different ways that artists approach um, the, the material and what those materials can say. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to blow dry this really quickly. That way when we're done talking about Peter Doig's work, we can just start painting. So I'm going to mute the microphone. Oops. I'm going to mute the microphone, not the music.
Okay, good to see there's Paula in the chat, and there's Carlito says, Happy Maple Leaf, I mean Canada Day. And there's Ashutosh Pal says, I am new here, welcome. Welcome, especially those new viewers, because it's, it's awesome to see new people uh, tuning in and maybe learning a little something different, experimenting with a whole different way of painting. So, let's move on to our next step here. Just making myself some room. Oh, you know what? I just remembered. Um, just before I do move on, just because I, I, I put this yellow on here, and sometimes people are like, what is that yellow? Okay, so they're in the description below there is more information, and I have talked about this exhaustively in the very first few episodes of the Master Study series. But these are the paints that I'm using. This is the brand of paint, I'm not sponsored or paid by them. So uh, this is the color I just applied, this Azo Yellow Deep. Now, if you don't have Amsterdam paint, you don't have to use Amsterdam paint. You can use golden paint. This is a higher quality paint, and this is roughly the exact same color I just used, right? This is what we're using here is called a limited palette or a split complement or split primary palette, sorry. Uh, here's Liquitex. This is that they make two, actually I think they make three grades of paint. This this would be their student grade paint that you could use. Their Windsor and Newton uh, brand, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply chain here in North America. Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, and Dyler Rowney. So you can use any of those paints to get the effects that we're going to be doing today. Okay. So let's just spend um, about 10 minutes here talking a little bit about Peter Doig and his biography and uh, why he's such an important artist and and so a little bit of the story behind today's specific painting. Okay. So let's go here. So let's make that a bit bigger. Uh, so Peter Doig is originally born in Scotland in 1959. So that makes him 63 years old uh, as of today. And I don't know, just thinking about that, just he, it's, I, I'm surprised actually he's, he's as old as he is. Not, you know, I'm in my mid forties here, so I'm not, not saying that he's an old man, but it's, I think, it's surprising to me just as I was putting together today's episode, thinking about how long he's really been around as an influential figure in the art world, because really he's, he made his, his entrance into the art world in the mid 1990s. And that seems like a long time ago. So it's like, wow, I, I, man, he's, he's sort of now, um, I think many people would consider Peter Doig to be probably like the preeminent painter of our time and uh, one of the most important figurative paint painters or uh, what some people may call naturalistic uh, representational painting as opposed to a much more abstract painting although there's a lot of abstract uh, qualities to Peter Doig's paintings anyway um, let's just talk a little bit about his early life so he's born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and and this begins sort of the feature of him and his family moving all over, not just down the street, but literally across the ocean, back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. And I know I'm going to get a few of these trips wrong, but um, so he's born in 1962, and then in 1966 moves to Montreal, Canada, and he's there, I think, for the next... 12, 13 or so years of his life where he lives in Canada. So his sort of, uh, you know, if you look at, let's say, the, the National Gallery of Canada's own uh, information on him, they sort of talk about him being, you know, that he was raised in Canada, which I suppose is true from, I think, the age of 7 to 19 or 18, he, he grew up in Montreal in Canada. And, you know, that, that's a pretty formative age for anyone, right? You know, we sort of, prior to around age six, we don't really have that many memories of our youth. So 
a lot of the imagery that is that features in Peter Doig's artwork is from the from things that he saw in Canada with his own eyes or photographs that he took or television movies things that that were in the that that were in the kind of the pop culture realm in Canada at that time because you know Canada is a is a unique place even though we're right next to the United States everything is sort of filtered a little bit through that Canadian lens and um, which I learned being a, uh, when I was in my teens went down to I lived in New York for a year went to art school there and then went to uh, school at the Royal College in London England and then to Los Angeles and uh, where I got my master's degree in painting and growing up in Canada and then going to New York and Los Angeles and London England and then coming back to Canada you realize like how unique and different Canada is in in good and bad ways potentially right um, I remember especially being a younger kid going to uh, coming back to, to Calgary Alberta where I grew up Calgary seemed like a very small town when you come back from New York or Los Angeles so um, like just watching television in Canada seemed very slow um, but now that I'm a little bit older I actually really appreciate that because there's just the news in Canada is just much slower which I think is a good thing for news not to be quite as wild as it is elsewhere in the world anyway just a little bit of a digression but I just that's one way that, you know that I identify with his work and I think it's a good idea for us to sort of you know try to identify with the artist and try to understand a little bit about who they are because it helps us understand a little bit about their artwork um, maybe we could just have so I th actually maybe before I jump in that just let me look at these dates so in 1979 he studies art at the Wimbledon Art School um, and then I th and then goes to the St. Martin's School of Art which is a which especially at that time actually even maybe a little bit later St. Martin's becomes one of the most important art schools in England along with the Royal College of Art and the, the uh, Chelsea School of Art there was a lot of them in London right um, and and then so he does go to Chelsea but but after St. Martin's he comes back to Canada for about five years and then he goes back to to London to, to get his master's degree at Chelsea School of Art and then so again there's this lots of traveling back and forth I think oh you know what I even forgot to mention see I told you I was gonna forget a few things he did after being born in Scotland his family moved to Trinidad so really the first five years of his life were growing up in Trinidad where his father worked for a shipping company and so that's that's where Peter Doig lives today as well as in Germany where he's he teaches art at the Fine Arts Academy in Dusseldorf um, but uh, so there's I think there's a lot of different influences and I was, I was reading an interview with him where he talks about you know I guess if you have to label me something you could call me a Scottish painter but I'm really sort of you know from a lot of different places and uh, and I think, I think that the the fact that it's that his that he has had all these different places where he grew up, I, what I th I think it does is, I see that, and I, maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but his work is very hard to place. Like you're looking at it and thinking, everything seems so different. What is what what unifies all of these strange paintings together that don't seem to have anything in common but maybe the way that the paint is applied and so I think that might be that's also probably maybe especially when he was younger how he might have felt as someone who's a little bit not quite fitting into whatever kind of culture or community he's at at the moment um, so and you know it's also interesting too you know he did most of the paintings that he did that feature Canadian landmarks or locations, landscapes, um, buildings. A lot of those artworks were done while he was 
outside of Canada. So um, some of the most famous paintings he did of the, that are so many of the most famous paintings that he's done, especially kind of in the 90s and early 2000s, were about Canada, but they were painted outside of Canada. And then subsequently moving to Trinidad, where he is now, he's, he was doing images that seem very, like using images from Germany, and um, where he was, he has spent a lot of time where he now spends part of his, his uh, year. So, and I think that's also kind of something that happens, you know, if you're a traveler, as, as, as I've been, often when we go away somewhere, that's when we start kind of thinking a little bit more about home um, and uh, maybe because we miss home or we have conflicted feelings about home all those kinds of things right so maybe just uh, we could just sort of I should have kind of brought this up here but here's Edinburgh Scotland in the northern uh, United Kingdom so it goes from there all the way to Montreal right here and then goes, uh, or sorry, he went <laughs> Scotland down to Trinidad here, which is you know on the very northern part of uh, South America here. All right, goes to Trinidad, and then goes to Montreal, and then goes uh, to London, and then goes to where does he go back? I think he goes to to Toronto. And then he goes back to to London for the Chelsea School of Art for his master's degree. So there's just this bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing, and that could be both both exciting and and kind of a little bit uh, traumatic as a child, right? Um, what else do I want to say down here in his biography? Uh, kind of famously, Peter Doig was nominated for the Turner Prize, which is really the, the biggest art prize. Well, it is the biggest art prize in the United Kingdom, uh, but arguably the largest and most important uh, art prize in the world because there's just so much attention paid to this, although it's only eligible for people that have some connection to the United Kingdom or live presently in the United Kingdom. Um, but that sort of really put him on the map and uh, when he when he exhibited as part of the 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 Turner Prize, I think there was a lot of excitement at that moment because there had been this discussion within the art world for about a decade that painting is dead, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people like, "What painting is dead? How's that?" I remember when I went to art school and graduate school, that's all people would talk about, and essays that we would have to read about is painting dead and what is what does that mean painting being dead how a painting is a piece of canvas stretched over a piece of wood how does that how could it even be dead but the idea is that painting had sort of run its course you know we've had a good couple thousand years of painting we could go back even further if you're talking about you know people painting on cave walls etc but um that other forms of art had sort of superseded it and painting was was maybe an activity you could do in your spare time for fun but art had now moved beyond the canvas into installation art video photography uh, performance art sound art text art and that painting just seemed a little bit passe like what can painting do now that we have all of these other things? You know, the same way that people might have thought about radio at the advent of film and then television making film irrelevant. And we all know, like, now radio has made a huge comeback and podcasts are really important. And television once, you know, it seemed like film was destroyed and then film made a big comeback and now Netflix, you know, so it's... You know the same sort of thing with painting is people thought painting was kind of dead or at least there was some some well-known critics and writers who were kind of championing that idea and then peter doig comes around and starts making these these paintings which really get people excited about the possibilities of painting that painting might still have um things that can be mined from it and produced from it so 
Also, it it you know goes without saying that the, in terms of the art market, Peter Doig is is probably the most successful living artist of all time. I mean, you can see some of these auction prices for some of these paintings. You know, a, a painting that he made, uh, Swamped, was sold in 2015 for 20, 26 million, and then in 2021 for 39 million. I mean, so those are huge prices for a living artist. The likelihood is he doesn't see a penny of those uh, of, uh, of those sales, right? Somebody might have bought that painting from him for a couple thousand dollars from his studio way back in the late 1980s, and now they're selling it for forty million dollars, right? But that seems how the how art works. <laughs> So, um, I got a lot of links here for really interesting, um, I just want to see, what do we want? Um, so here's like Maclean's Magazine, which is, is one of the, 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 the major magazines here in Canada. And just sort of talking about, you know, just what I just said here. Uh, he paints Canada from Trinidad or painted Canada from London and then paints Trinidad from Germany and Germany from Trinidad. <laughs> Etc. And there's also, I think, you know, a number. Um, of you know, because Canada has such a strong painting tradition with relationship to the landscape, and that the group of seven being the most, arguably the most important landscape painters in Canadian history. And then you have Peter Doig coming along a hundred years later, who's reinvigorating the landscape and the Canadian landscape painting tradition. There's obviously immediately these um, these associations and connections that anyone writing about landscape art in Canada uh, will uh, uh, will talk about. In fact, one of the paintings that in fact let's just zoom in here. So this is a Peter Doig painting. And you can see him using these very bright, kind of unconventional colors. You know, these pinks and almost fluorescent yellows and greens. And a painting like that is just like, what on earth is that? It looks like some kind of druid, you know, uh, watching a iPad on top of a hill overlooking a burning land lava-filled landscape. Right? That's, that is really weird. And then you look at the source image for this particular painting, and this is Franklin Carmichael, who was a member of the Group of Seven, painting a landscape with one of these pochade boxes, or might have just been a, a cigar box, on his lap, sitting on a rock or a stump overlooking this vista, right? So this this is a, a, a document of an artist painting 100 years ago, almost, uh, Franklin Carmichael being a, an integral member of the Group of Seven, not one of the most famous, but but certainly uh, a key member. And then the way that Peter Doig has um, uh, kind of reinterpreted that photograph and made it look very strange and unusual. So yes, there is a figure in here. Yes, there is a kind of a landscape in there, but they are done in such a way that they're almost beyond recognizability and even by flipping the image it sort of continues to kind of make tenuous the relationship between the original and the the outcome of this of his sort of process um, let's see if, what else here Oh, I mean, here's a couple of just while we're talking about this seriously like here's a Tom Thompson painting and I know there's a few people as part of our community who have done this painting and looked at Tom Thompson. We did five episodes on Tom Thompson a year ago. So here's a, an earlier Tom Thompson painting. He died in 1917, but really only had about four years of productivity. Here's another Tom Thompson. We did this painting here, the West Wind, part of our series. And then you can see how Peter Doig kind of takes, this is a very famous painting of his White Canoe, which I think this is one of those paintings that sold for like four 30 40 million dollars recently um, where yeah, it, it has some components or qualities of, of even Tom Thompson's work in terms of like these fairly bright colors 
and also just the way that the the way that he's painting because one th one thing I've noticed with Tom Thompson's work and we talked about it with Tom Thompson is the way that he kind of shuttles back and forth between the foreground and background and sometimes painting foreground or background layers kind of almost in front of the foreground creating the this weird uh, spatial confusion um, and Peter Doig really plays with that um, even more. So he's taken like a quality of Tom Thompson's work and then expanded it and made it even more significant and important. Um, probably, you know, one might even say that it, he's taken something that that uh, that Tom Thompson may even have done by accident or or. Maybe deliberately, but 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 certainly not trying to emphasize or point it out. But another artist like Peter Doig noticed that and then amplified it. Uh, okay, let's uh, we're going to move into today's painting and get this thing started here. So just want to mention that the the painting itself, one hundred years ago, this is currently in the collection of the Centre Pompidou Art Museum in Central Paris. Uh, the Pompidou is a great museum. It's it's really the 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 museum of modern art of France, and it's a very iconic building that is famously sort of inside out. And you can see kind of from the logo, there's that uh, escalator that goes along the outside of the building. And anyway, this painting, and I just I should also I kind of wanted to show just the scale of it here, so you can see, you know, it's. It's about like two arms length wide, right? I think it's like 230 centimeters by by 200, 180 centimeters tall or something. So it's a substantial painting. It's kind of large. And we can even just see a little bit about some of the textures in here, which don't really seem to come across so much in the, uh, in the photograph that, that we have here because it's just the way that the lighting is raking across the painting on the side just gives us a little bit of an idea of how he's working here with lots of layers and staining and wiping layers away. So we might do a little bit of that today. I don't know how, how much we want to do with this particular painting because uh, we want to try to keep it kind of simple. But one of the features with that I identify with, with uh, Peter Doig is that real experimentation with materials and layering. And layering, artists, painters have been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but just the way that he does it and allows kind of the... Like, traditionally when artists talk about layering, it's like uh, using glazing, where we're building up thin layers of paint, like uh, Leonardo da Vinci in the Mona Lisa, right? The sfumato technique of, of that super smooth... Um, facial features where we don't see any brush strokes whatever whatsoever that's how we get that famous enigmatic smile of the Mona Lisa Peter Doig is also layering paint but in a very different way right where instead of trying to hide all those layers so that they build up into this seamless perfect surface Peter Doig is is building up layers but allowing us to see what they are, right? So almost like a, almost like Jackson Pollock in the sense that we, Jackson Pollock is sort of often talked about of like this um, web-like structure of the the drips. Peter Doig isn't dripping paint, but we still have this kind of surface that is that um, is built up in a similar kind of. Um, what would you call it membrane like surface I don't know anyway so this is the painting itself this is the location of it and I and I think it might be just kind of nice just to take a second to kind of think about where this image comes from so originally can I zoom in on this oops come on so uh, one of the things as I said Peter Doig is not only influenced by the landscape that he saw and stood in front of and walked around in his youth, whether that was in Canada, Trinidad, Scotland, England, or Germany, but also pop culture. 
And one of the things that he's he's interested in is rock music and the Allman Brothers here. So this is an Allman Brothers album, or sorry, Dwayne Allman, one of the members of the Allman Brothers. And we can see inside when you open up the album, there is this photograph of all the members of the Allman Brothers in a canoe paddling. But the bassist here is sort of the only one that appears to ha not have a, uh, um, an oar. Here's a close-up picture of it. And he's sort of focused on this, uh, this figure right here that we see in the painting here, right? So he sort of extracted the, the, that one person out of the photograph while still maintaining the entire canoe. So we're, we have this canoe that once had four other people on it, but now this person is just there, isolated by themselves, without a paddle. You know, up the river without a paddle, as the saying goes, right? You're really screwed, right? So here's this figure in a l big canoe. That's a huge canoe, and to not have a paddle is a little bit alarming. Beyond that, you can see also that there's this island in the background, and that island relates to a few different things. Um, one of which is this island off the coast of Trinidad and uh, Trinidad, sorry, and which is a, a prison island here. This is Carrera Island. Let's see if we can zoom in here, which um, has been a prison. Like a, I guess you could say like a prison colony, uh, but it's really not that big. You can see, you know, you could probably run across it here in, in ten minutes. Um, but I've, I was sort of reading. They've they've been talking about decommissioning this prison for for decades, and I think at least as of twenty nineteen, it was still an active prison. So. Um, you know, it's a kind of basically like uh, Alcatraz, I guess you could call, you could say Alcatraz, off the coast of San Francisco, and so there's that image that he's sort of kind of inserted into the background, but of course it also uh, has a relationship to art history as well. Here is this Arnold Bocklin painting, Island of the Dead, which is a very famous painting. This is the version that I think is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yeah, because he made a few different versions. Yeah, this is in Gallery 800 at the Met. And here's here's probably the, the bit more famous version of this. Where is this one? This is at the Alta National Gallery Stalicht Musée du Zoo Berlin. Okay. So th and it's funny because I there's I can't remember who but there's somebody who keeps contacting me saying when are you gonna do this painting? Because oddly enough, this p particular painting was at one point really one of the most famous paintings around. There there's many people in Europe who had prints of this painting inside their home, which is kind of you know, an interesting, unique choice. I mean, I love this painting, but it's uh, it's kind of a little bit gloomy and mysterious to think that there, this was a painting that at one point was about as on vogue and more popular than the Mona Lisa or um, you know a lot of other paintings is you know a little bit eye opening. So anyway, we have a lot of these kind of connections that he weaves together, as well as from uh, movies. So here's, this is, I'm not going to play this clip, but this is really the final scene from Friday the 13th, the movie. Friday the 13th is a, a, a horror movie ch um, franchise that has been around since 1980. So the very first movie here, and if you're not familiar, Friday the 13th is the one where there's the guy that has the hockey mask and the knife and runs around killing people. And... So he's used this same image elsewhere of this girl at the very end of the movie, uh, the kind of the heroine, the star of the movie, sort of makes her final escape, and she's just sort of drifting in this canoe through the, the water after she's finally escaped Jason, the, 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 the villain of the franchise. But I think for whatever reason, that image kind of really struck with him. And not to, uh, 
<laughs> spoil the ending here for you, but right at the very end, guess who comes out of the water? Well, you'll have to watch the movie. Anyway, so there's a lot of a lot of things that come together in this one particular artwork, uh, whether it's um, the basis from the Allman Brothers inside the who's mysteriously on this canoe by himself, this gigantic canoe without a paddle, um, who seems to be floating in this in the ocean in front of this prison island off of Tobago or Trinidad. Is it or was it? Yeah, yeah, off of Trinidad, and that also bears uh, a resemblance to a very famous painting in art history. All of those things colliding together, collaged together into this one painting, and then and then it's sort of left to us as a viewer, who probably doesn't know any of those associations, to sort of. Uh, absorb the painting as it is and then try to make some sense out of it and it's sort of you know I'm sure Peter Doig has some thoughts and feelings about what this painting means uh, and but you know as you know just I'll just give you my reading of the painting is you know we have this this kind of lonely figure who's looking right at us making direct eye contact to us but he's not like waving like, hey, help me, I'm in the ocean all by myself and this huge canoe and I don't have a paddle, help me. And I'm, you know, I might be drifting towards this prison island that's kind of on the horizon. There's none of that. There's almost this sort of resigned, um, uh, this, this figure who's resigned to the fate of maybe, you know, drifting out into the ocean and disappearing forever. So there's a lot of kind. There's this kind of melancholy thing of, what is this guy doing? Doesn't isn't he worried that he's, he's just sort of, drifting aimlessly, towards this kind of potentially menacing island and the sky that appears to um, like it ha kind of looks like it could be raining, um, does not seem like, a very prudent idea for a. Um, for a canoe trip to go to go in this direction. The other, last thing I just mentioned is if we just look at the reflection, it's also very strange. Like, look how we've got the, the this left side of the canoe reflecting. The figure is also reflecting. But as we move over to the right side of the canvas, that reflection disappears, which is very strange, right? Like, what what's going on there? And actually, just before I move on, I, I do want to... just makes me want to check. Okay, interesting. If we look at the original album from the Allman Brothers, or sorry, from the Dwayne Allman um, LP, there also d lacks that shadow on the far end, which probably gives us an idea of how the orientation of the canoe is to the sun. But still, you know, in in when we see a photograph like that, we can we can just accept it as as normal. I think when we start reinterpreting things as as paintings, that missing reflection to me adds another level of uncanniness to the painting as to like well that is that's really weird and you can say well, well that's what the photograph looked like but I always think sometimes you got to make it wrong to make it right um, if it's even if it's there in the photograph so by him not including that I think he's deliberately amping up the strangeness of this painting the other thing too is we don't have any reflection of the island in the water either, right? So that's that is also very strange. Like if we were, you know, an island floating, you know, I guess I guess if it's a certain distance away, we're not going to see that reflection here in a, in the ocean, but it, it doesn't really matter because, you know, this seems like a very placid water if anything it actually kind of to me looks a little bit like a wall as opposed to this receding uh, plane of water that is kind of um, you know like uh, receding you know it's parallel to the surface of the earth it seems almost to me vertical so there's a lot of strange things going on in this painting anyway let's get to the painting itself and start painting. So, um, 
So typically, you know, at this stage, I often do a little bit of underpainting. Do I want, do we need to do any underpainting? Here would be the question. My only th thing about doing underpainting would be to potentially do the figure. But I think this painting is so relatively, you know what, let's, let's do a little bit of that figure because I'm just trying to remember that this is an introductory painting class and there might be a few people that might need that. So let's, let's do that. And, um, but if I was painting this painting on my own, th that this would not be something that I would see as a priority for myself because I'm, I have a certain amount of confidence that even if I painted this whole thing out, that I could probably um, locate those details within reasonable accuracy. So you see I'm putting most of the paint, I'm, I'm going to put all my colors that I typically use on this canvas or on my palette um, because I'm not sure at the moment exactly which ones I'll need and which ones I, I won't need. So I'm, I suspect I'm going to need most of them. Let's get some more paint out here. Oh, interesting. Ashutosh says, what is the history behind Canada Day? Um... Well, that's a great question. Um, July 1st, 1887. I should know this. <laughs> I'm sure there's people who've done the citizenship test who know better than I, but um, July 1st, 1887, I think is the date uh, when, when Canada was officially formed as a nation because prior to that it was just a colony, a British colony, and so Canada was given a certain amount of autonomy over um, over its future uh, because Canada was for a long time a colony of the of the British um, uh, Empire. <laughs> so yeah, interesting question. Um, so ever since then, we've been celebrating on July first, Canada Day. July 4th, this coming Monday, is American Independence Day from the United Kingdom, right? So Canada celebrates our own sort of semi-independence because Canada is still technically part of the Commonwealth and a and uh, part of the Dominion of the United Kingdom. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on. So. Um, I'm going to mix a dark color here. So I'm going to mix basically a black, and I'll show you how to do that. So I'm going to take my cool blue and my warm red, and I'm going to mix these together. So they're, these colors are almost opposite from one another on the color wheel. So when I mix them together, we get this kind of very dark purple. If I wanted a much more intense, bright, happy purple, I would mix my warm blue with my cool red, and I get something very, very different. All right. So now I've got this this purple. Um, I I I would I could paint with that and be very happy. But let's just I'll just show you since we're just doing this. If I take some cool yellow and mix this into here, we're gonna get a black. And at first, you know, it's gonna the colors are gonna change because we're mixing it all together like a blender. And so this color might kind of go a little bit brown because if it's a little bit brown, that tells us we've got a, maybe a lot of yellow and red and we need to put a little bit more blue in it. If it goes a little bit green, that tells us we've got a lot of yellow and red and we need, or so we got a lot of yellow and blue and we need more red. So you're just sort of managing these, uh, the, the ratios, right? So. I 
let's get a small brush out. We don't need a lot of this, but um, I think it is just worth just checking how he did his version here. That's as far in as I can zoom. So, um, you know what I'm going to do, well, I was going to paint this whole thing black and then paint over it. Ideally, it would be nice to preserve some of the yellow that's inside here, but be because of the scale of this painting, I mean, that's my fingernail, right? We don't have a lot of room to work with, so I think I am going to paint over this funny about that okay so I'm gonna paint over uh, over some of this area on the inside with, with something that's got a bit of white and that's actually gonna kind of bring out I can even preserve some of these darker things as edges kind of like as if I'm outlining it but we'll get there shortly maybe do we need to do anything in the background here Maybe we'll do just a bit of these bushes, because I'm going to paint a lot of stuff back there. The sky, and it might be nice just to preserve a bit of this. Maybe even... Again, I don't typically do this kind of thing on my own, but this might be helpful for probably some people out there, especially when we start getting more layers of paint onto this canvas. And sometimes it can be kind of confusing to see where things go. So you know what, let's just, I'm gonna do this horizon line too. There we go. Wipe the brush off and clean the brush. I'll just clean all these up while we're right here. Okay, so let's go to our next step here. So the next step we're going to do is to paint the background and put some color into the background. And because we've painted a little bit of this underpainting, it's just going to make it maybe a little bit easier for us to, to not obliterate detail. So let's take a look at what color we want to use for that background. So right here, remember we, in fact, Look at how this is painted, very washy. It looks like, so Peter Doig is painting with oil paint, right? We're using acrylics, which is a, which is a different process for sure. 
Um, and one of the things that is you can do with oil paint is you can apply it like a stain and you can kind of splash it on and wipe it off with rags. And I think that's one of uh, Peter Doig's kind of main strategies is sort of these very thin turpentine like stains and allowing for drips to happen and then taking a rag with turpentine on it and probably wiping it away. We see a little bit of this right here and but look how different it looks when we see it from this angle here. Like look how how um I'm trying to think it kind of almost has the look of like you know you leave french fries on a napkin for 10 minutes and then it kind of creates this uh strange kind of semi-transparent quality on the on the napkin it's it's almost a little bit like that like a, a very weird semi-transparency on here so I think what would be the best way for us to replicate this his process here? Well, you know what? The first thing I want to do is I want to blow dry my underpaint here so that I don't smudge it when I start painting over it. It would be kind of nice to to get a bit of like a, uh, a washy quality. Um, so I think what I'm going to do oh, <laughs> is... I'm going to use a little bit of matte medium. I do have other mediums that we could apply into the paint, um, but uh, I, most people don't have those materials at home. So what I'm going to do is I'm applying matte medium. Matte medium is just a is is paint without any color in it. It's it's basically what's inside all these paints, except these paints have blue in it or red, or yellow pigments, right, or white, right, this is transparent, this will dry totally clear, maybe 99.9% .9 clear, sometimes a little bit foggy, especially if you layer it up, but anyway, let's take some of our blue, mix it in here, I'm going to take a little bit of white as well, um, not too much white because and the, and also if by putting in the matte medium here it's going to make it transparent so that that white won't completely hide the yellow that we painted previously so i'm going to paint this over top and i'm going to be kind of quite deliberate about allowing for maybe some streaks or brush strokes to happen here which which sounds easy but to try to keep preserve brush strokes because it's once you, if you see them there your instinct is to just get rid of them is to paint them over and to hide them and um, I think we want to try to uh, to preserve those aspects of the painting through subsequent layers. So we're going to build that up a bit. And so some areas I'm going to allow to get a little bit thicker. So 
So I kind of see a little bit of a streakiness happening here. Um, I just want to see if there's... There is a bit of... You know what? I'm going to take a bit... Even though this is technically not the background, this is right in the foreground, I'm going to do... I'm going to take the same color. I'm going to put a bit of warm blue in it and a little bit more white and paint the foreground here. So let's just take some of our warm... Oops. Taking some of my warm blue, I'm going to put this into this mixture. So now I've got warm blue and cool blue together. And because those these are pretty extreme contrasts of blue, right? One is much warmer, much closer to purple. The cool blue is much closer to a green. So by mixing them together, we're sort of bridging that gap. This becomes much more of like a what we call like a cobalt blue. Well, that's the, the name of the, the hue or the pigment. And I'm going to do similar to what I did above. And again, the way that I'm applying the paint, I'm not trying to get this perfect unified surface here. I'm allowing for it to be kind of a little bit uneven, a little bit... Um, a little imperfect, I guess. And then not only that, I'm going to take my rag here. And just like kind of he might have done, but with oil paints, just sort of like rub into this here. Let's just look at a different view. Yeah, and the paint is kind of already drying a little bit and kind of not blending properly. But that's okay. Like, that's, I think that's part of his, his sort of approach. Is because we're going to build this up even more. Just sort of. You can see, like, I wiped a little bit much and I took away some of the, the yellow, even. We got back to the white. I, again, I don't mind that. That's not necessarily a bad thing. We had that happen even just a little bit over here. Maybe maybe I'll just do a bit more of that, just so in case somebody had that problem, we'll deal with it together, right? Um, is there any other... Maybe I'll just kind of go into this surface here. Right, so my, my cloth is just sort of picking up some things there. Okay, let's just see, show you what that kind of looks like from above. And maybe also just what it looks like side by side with the original. Okay, let's tackle this area in, in here now. So that area's got a lot more white. Uh, it's almost got a bit of, so I'm gonna take my, my white. I'm gonna take even more warm blue. So now you can see, doesn't it look way more purpley? Even though there's there's no red tech, I mean there is, there is technically a little bit of almost like red pigment in it. That's why it gets a little bit warmer. 
but it's when we put those two blues side by side, this one that just looked like an ultramarine blue, which is what it is, all of a sudden, in contrast to the cool blue, just looks warmer, it looks more purpley. So I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this. It's, it's a little bit darker than I than I want to go, but remember, part of Doig's style is the sort of layering of paint. And so I'm just gonna kind of brush it in. And then again, I'm going to take my rag and let's look at another view here. Where I'm just going to kind of blend it out. And you, again, you want to be kind of careful that you're not um, pressing too hard or you're going to wipe away uh, the, the yellow and expose the canvas. Not, it's not an end of the world thing, but... Okay, so we got these sort of three different little phases of the painting. Okay. Bear Bait says thank you. Thank you for tuning in, Bear Bait. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to think if that's good enough. There's my fingerprint on the corner. So I just use a little bit of paint there and we'll paint over that. So I'm gonna blow dry this. I think, yeah. I think let's go to another step here. Okay, so now we've got our background um, begun, not finished, but the, the, it's established. Now let's do our foreground. And for for this purpose here, when I'm saying foreground, I'm just I'm gonna use this kind of uh, the island in the background as technically it means technically in the background but just for our painting process here as I'll, I'll call that foreground and I'll call this part of the foreground as well as the figure so we'll just kind of get those started I'm not gonna do too much there just get a little bit of color in and then we're gonna go back to the background in a few minutes here so um, let's paint this hill back here so i think i can wipe off let's I'm gonna wipe it off on here clean my brush let's get a smaller brush out and this green Let's put a, a colder green in here. So I'm take my cool yellow. Remember, this is the background, right? So we want cooler colors to be in the background. That works pretty well. I might just put just a little bit of white in there, not too much. Notice how like I scoop up some paint and I don't put the whole blob right in there. I just sort of put a little bit in and if I need more, I can scoop some of that in into that paint. So I'm gonna start with this. And you know what? I'm just going to paint this whole thing back over. Even that those little pathways that are white, I'm just going to paint the whole thing. 
even those trees. So I'll paint that. I am also tempted to do to take this what add more of that white in there. I'm just gonna come around. And then once that's done, I'm just going to take my rag again and just kind of soften that up a bit. Because I do see a bit of that in his. Okay. Maybe before I just go too far, I just forgot under in his armpit here. Oops. I didn't need to be quite so. Actually, let's just. start putting in some orange here so if we look at that orange we definitely this is a, a warm orange uh, using warm red and warm yellow uh, but I think I might just go let's I think I'm gonna start yeah let's start with this orange so I'm gonna put it a little bit more on just like the yellowy side of things Right, so just a little bit of, of red so that I can get this color underneath. So let's take Don't worry too much about getting the shape of that canoe in because we're going to paint that background, which is going to kind of uh, change it a bit. It's going to make just a bit more. Oops. So I'm even painting maybe a little bit over top of my lines because I can shape that back out later on. gonna take my rag here and just maybe soften up that a bit. Okay. There we are there. Just so you see the painting side by side at this particular stage. Looking good. Okay. So I'm just gonna quickly blow dry 
all of this. And then next I'm gonna go back in the background and really start finishing that those areas. So I would say like we're about halfway done this painting right now. Okay, there was some, a little bit of water. I don't know where that came from, but when I wiped it away, it wiped some of that paint away, which is a bit of a bummer, but it's not that bad of, because it seems like it's going to coincide perfectly with the white that I'll put in there. So just a happy accident, as Bob Ross used to say, right? Let's go to, let's go to, the, let's go back to the background now. Let's finish that background. Okay, so now we've we've done all the steps of the basically the painting has is well established now. We've got color everywhere. We haven't completely concealed the original yellow in prematura, but it's still there. But it, but it's there's it's you know we've built onto it that that in prematura is sort of like the the cheese on your on your hamburger or your sandwich, right? Or your your uh, club sandwich right there's the cheese and there's gonna be a lot of other things on top of it but if you bite into that cheese you might not or the sandwich you might not see the cheese but it's there it's at the you know the bottom of the sandwich so <laughs> let's go back and now we're going to finish the background here and this is where we, we you know we can have a lot of fun just thinking about how we want to ap apply color because the way that he applied it kind of you know, using a, a rag with turpentine. Obviously, we're painting with acrylic, so turpentine wouldn't make any sense, but... Um, uh, I'm just thinking about what, what interesting way could we approach this? I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating whether I want to use any other mediums in behind me. I don't think so because we haven't really talked about using them. I don't know if today is the day I want to introduce a whole nother material. I like that so far we've been able to do every painting with just a very, very limited selection of materials. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take my matte medium and my warm blue this time. And I'm gonna mix this in. Now notice I'm not putting a lot in. I'm gonna make this kind of fairly transparent, right? Cause that matte medium is clear, right? It's clear paint, has no pigment. So we put this, this uh, warm blue into it. And A debate. Um, well, let's look at this image again and just see what on earth was he doing here. Like you can see him wiping that away. Okay, so I think to do this, I'm going to put this on here. in a kind of almost haphazard way. And then I'm gonna kind of do this wiping. Now I gotta be careful because I can already feel it getting a little bit tacky and that paint wants to, what, what's gonna happen is, is, you know, it's sort of like a sticker on a book cover or something. If it, as it starts to dry, 
if I peel it off, I might peel off the paint that's underneath it. It will stick to that and peel it off, wipe it away, just like that little white spot. So that, we get a little bit of that on here. It almost, yeah, so I'm going to blow dry that. Let's do that a few times. We're going to do this a few times like that. I'm going to add maybe just a little bit more blue in there. And maybe instead of using a rag to kind of smudge it, I'm just going to use my brush to do a bit of smudging. So I'm just taking a bit more paint, more of this warm blue as I as I go here. Okay, let's blow dry. Actually, you know what? Instead of blow drying it, let's maybe look at I can take that same color I put a bit of more matte medium back into it oops maybe a little much but because this is a warm color so having it kind of in the the foreground Okay, so instead of putting this blue here, let's take some of the warm yellow, mix that in, and let's take this, a lot of matte medium. Similarly, kind of just dabbing it away, blending, smudging. Maybe going back into it a bit. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm going to take a bit of that as, as well. Maybe, maybe an area that has maybe just a little bit less medium in it, so it's a little bit stronger. I mean, essentially, what we've got here is underneath we've got that warm yellow, so it kind of almost acts a little bit like that green that we just put underneath there because it's mixing with some of the warm blue. Okay, that's coming along. I'm gonna, let's blow dry that, and I think I'm just gonna do a little bit more work in the sky, and then we're gonna come down and finish this bottom part here.
I maybe take a bit of this green. It looks like maybe there's a little bit of it up there. But this is how you get that really gorgeous, complex layering of color that Doig is so famous for. Is these thin, transparent layers, just like Mona Lisa, but obviously totally different results, right? And different method of applying it. So let's go back to this, um, our warm blue and our matte medium. Let's take matte medium, warm blue. We'll take even more of it. This time I'm also going to take a little bit of our black, mix that in there. That's going to darken it down by adding a little bit of shade in there. It's going to, it's also going to deaden that color. So it's not going to be quite as vibrant, which is, which makes sense because usually colors in the background are not as vibrant as the colors in the foreground, right? This time as well, I'm going to go for a bit of a smaller brush. Let's look at them side by side here. So I want to emphasize these sort of vertical lines in here. But you see how I'm not just obliterating everything that was there. It's all kind of staying there. In fact, in some ways it sort of becomes more apparent as I kind of painting over it. And I want to leave kind of a bit of a halo effect here. Here's my darker color again. If you want to build up a little bit more opaque areas, just paint more of that in those areas, right? And if you go too far, just take your rag and wipe off some of that excess paint. And there's Lolly just joined us in the chat. Hey, Lolly, how are you doing today? Okay, let's blow dry that. And then I'm going to do that again, and I wonder, this time I'm going to go for just a bit more of the warm blue in here. Maybe even a little bit more opaque. The warm blue is fairly transparent anyway, but... a little much. I can just soften it a bit.
And don't be afraid to go down over top of that white there, right? Let's blow dry all that. You know, I think I need to make this much a deeper, warmer blue, which is a little bit strange because usually we want that warm blue to be down here and the cool blue to be up here, and he's sort of inverted things. And I think because of that inversion, it helps to create that bit of a strange, uncanny quality where he's using the warm and cool color temperatures incorrectly. You know, technically you want traditionally you would want your warm colors to be in the foreground and your cool colors to be in the background he's sort of inverting it and I think that creates a strangeness that most people aren't really aware of um, and but I think that's that's sort of at the heart of the un, the whole idea of the uncanny is that there's something beyond we're, we're uncomfortable and we're not really sure why right so I'm gonna take more of my warm blue this time. I'm gonna take my uh, matte medium. Oops. I wanna have a much higher ratio of warm blue to matte medium. And let's see if we can So I'm not obliterating everything I just painted. It's all there. It's just going to be a little bit more... Um, uh, it's going to come through in subsequent layers, right? Because we've put that matte medium in there to make it a bit more transparent. You know, it almost looks like I could do that again, right? Get it even deeper. So I got maybe a bit more of a halo there. So let's just, I'm going to do it one more time and maybe just bring it down a little bit lower here.
So let's do that again. Take our warm blue. And glazing fluid, not so much, but just a bit. And actually this time I also just wanted to see if I can get, I'm gonna come down a little bit closer over top of this hill area here. take a bit more of my black even just get a bit more of that especially oh that's a little much Okay, I think that's pretty good. Like in person, I think that's as deep as the color of the original. So I think, it, um, you know, I have, it's a little bit brighter on camera just so that it shows up really well and you can see all the details. But I think that's actually pretty darn close. And it doesn't look exactly like it does on camera, but I'm pretty confident that I've, I've got pretty, I've got it here. Um, okay. I'm just going to clean these brushes, even though I'm, I'm probably going to use them with the same color, but sometimes, especially if I'm doing kind of a little bit drier brush stuff, things start to stick on the, the brush. And, um, now, what should we do next? I think probably the island. Let's do the island in the background next. So we've got some of these colors well established already. Um, so let's just kind of build on that. I think, you know, previously we took a cool yellow or cool or brown. Or, I mean, I'll go through every color until I get to it. Previously I, I mixed a cool green here as the foundational color. And then I put some, uh, and then now I'm going to put a, uh, bit, well, I was going to do a bit of a warmer yeah, let's let's we're gonna still do a bit of a warmer blue. I'm gonna take a bit of a smaller mixture of it and mix this up here, my warm blue. And I'm gonna paint this that's kind of thin, that's okay. Now I'm going to take my black 
that I mixed, right? I'm going to mix it in with this green. So it's not going to be pure black anymore. It's a bit more of a greenish black. I assure you it'll look very black here on top of the green because it's much darker, but we can build that up as well. As I see, I can see all those little buildings up there. We'll, we'll get to a bit of that. I'm not sure how much detail we'll actually end up putting in this painting back there, but. I'm also just going to kind of bring a bit of this horizon line back here kind of sloppily because we're going to paint kind of a white um, over top of it so it's just gonna once we do do that this line will kind of disappear a bit this camera just overheated I guess it's the beginning of summer that's a, I, that's a good thing I guess that the cameras um, getting too hot in there See, it takes once it overheats like that, it comes back on and goes a little bit darker. So I might just let's see. I think it's slowly coming back online. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to the hill here. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a bit of white. I am going to take just a little bit of my green here and put that a bit into the white. Very, very subtle. Just because white on its own is just such a total, like really, really strong color. And I always kind of get a little bit of afraid that it's going to be too much. It's going to take too much attention away from the foreground. Now remember, this painting is about two meters uh, wide, right? It's a big painting. So, you know, like if we just take a second here, like that's, come on, that's the scale of the painting itself, and we're doing this tiny little detail, and so that that whole, in fact, let's just see how big is it. 
that hill is about the size of his this this island in the background is the size of his torso, right? You could from his chin all the way down to his crotch there, you could fit it right in there, right? You could, he could hold it in his jacket. Here, it's about the size of my thumb. Right? Let's just bear that in mind if you're struggling with getting these details. That we're talking about something is way smaller. All right, remember there was that little bit of a, a blob that I wiped away that just disappears underneath that white. You notice as it dries it gets a little bit more transparent and which can be a good thing because maybe it might be a little bit intense you might want to just to calm it down just a little bit okay um, while that's happening let's take a bit of I'm just going to take a bit of this orange that I had up there previously. Take a little bit of um, matte medium. Just make it a little bit less opaque. And I'm not really going to bother trying to, to do too many details here. Just kind of hinting that there's something there. Now I'm, I'm not even going to bother cleaning my brush. Take out, take more of this black that we mixed for our underpainting, and I'm going to take this maybe just a little bit of green on there, mostly just the black on its own, and just give a few areas a little bit darker. like that okay and then just lastly now I'm just going to take the black on its own and just do a few little areas of just sort of very uh, concentrated black and I may even come back here and do a bit of this again towards the very very end because this will as it dries get it's a little bit less opaque I guess maybe that could be just a little bit more green. Let's take a bit more warm blue and warm yellow.
Okay, I think that's probably good enough, right? Okay, let's um, let's move on. Okay, I think for our purpose, that top uh, third of the painting is essentially done, right? We can move on. Wow, look at all the comments in the chat. Fish and chips. Oh, there's Donna saying hello. <laughs> the Green Party said no mowing. Let the bees survive. All kinds of flowers will show up on your lawn. Interesting. <laughs> you got to take care of those bees, all right? What? How? How are we going to pollinate all of our plants without bees? Okay. So, if I just look at this, I think next step will be to paint the white, or this kind of white, I guess here. And then we'll do the foreground, uh, the, the water in the foreground, I mean. Okay. I'll go for the, a, some kind of medium, because I, I don't want it to be too big. One thing, uh, big brushes are great for getting really smooth areas of, of solid color. But we can see with Doig is that he likes there to be a lot of um, brush strokes and a lot of, um, uh, I guess you could call it inconsistencies as a negative, but as he likes to have a lot of nuances, I guess would be the opposite way of thinking about it. So by using a smaller brush, we're just necessarily gonna get that because it's gonna be less even. Um, where should we do this? I'm gonna go back to this area here. Let's take some of this white. Just mixing it right directly into this warm blue that I had there before. And I'm gonna put some matte medium there again to keep this paint kind of transparent. So I should put a bit more. In there. So I'll just move a bit of that out of the way. Now that I put a bunch more of that white in there, I'm just gonna. So I got that's a big blob of paint. Just take that off of my brush, and as I go, I'm gonna kind of start by maybe cleaning this line up in the background. See, I'm not painting directly, completely over. In fact, let's zoom in. I'm not gonna paint right over the entire black line there. I wanna keep it as a bit of uh, an outline there. And he did the same thing. So areas where I brushed all that blue down over top. A little speck of paint there, but I'll just leave it there. It'll look like a, a boat or something on the horizon. Okay, so maybe just before I go too much further, I want to zoom quite far out or look at this from across the room to see if I can see how straight that line is. Because that's this, that's the kind of thing you might not notice when you're 
nose is right over the painting like this and then you get it up on the wall and you're sitting across from like wow that horizon line is really crooked or it kind of goes up and down and so by looking at it from a little bit further away you can see those those things that you just can't see you know it's the same thing like if you're hanging a painting like or you put it on the wall and you're like wow it looks perfect and then you go sit down and you're like whoa how on like it's so crooked i can't believe i thought that that was straight right so i think that's okay it does kind of seem like it maybe goes up a little bit and maybe even a little bit lower on this side maybe let's just do a little double check here and see if we're still in the zone seven and a half centimeters seven and a half it does sort of rise a little bit on the right a tiny bit maybe i will come back Now that's pretty opaque, so I want something just a bit more transparency on here. Because I can always add more paint. But if I put too much on too early, well then i got to live with it, right? I mean, I, I can actually, you know what, take my rags, since I've been doing a lot of this in today's painting, and just kind of scrub that back. Now it looks like it dips down, doesn't it? Ay, 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 ay. I mean, we could have just used tape, obviously, as well. I feel like that side is pretty high. I mean, we can try to take some water and pull that back a bit. I don't know if that did much. That's the water. It goes up and down, right? So we've got those transparencies, but now I want to just also maybe bring a little bit of that color back into my mixture. So we just have just pure white. So maybe let's just take that color, that warm blue, and a little bit, put, put a little bit of warm yellow into it. Give it just a tiny bit of a greenish cast.
fact, I'm just going to take a bit more blue. Right, I'm, we're talking like small micro bits of pigment in here. I think there's maybe a bit of cool blue in there too. Mm. A little bit of that. A little bit of that. Maybe let's put a. Uh, let's take a little bit of that cool blue. Warm blue, a bit more of a cobalty quality. Oops, that's too much. for just a bit more of just the cool blue. Or sorry, warm blue, my apology. A bit more warm blue on the brush. You notice I'm paint, I didn't, I didn't blow dry, I'm sort of painting wet into wet paint. With acrylic paint, we're not gonna get quite the same effect we do with oil paint, but if we're kind of quick like this, we can kind of blend it a bit together. I could put like a slow dry medium in here to give me a little bit more open working time, but I think I'm fine. And then I'm just going to go for just a bit more of a white. You can use another brush just to kind of, just like a blending brush, just to smooth things out a bit. A little bit of white splattered up into the sky there. It kind of looks like a bit of a star, so maybe that's just a. Maybe it needed to be there.
Okay. I think that might be good enough. Right? Lots of little areas of fun in there, so I'm just going to keep that, maybe. Okay, let's come down to the bottom half of this painting, or, well, the bottom third, let's say, one, two, three. So this area is a little bit of a cooler blue, um, so and it's just a bit of a green. I'm going to keep this area here working. So let's take our white. So notice there's a bit of, of uh, yellow in there, a warm yellow. Let's put some matte medium into here. It's got a bit of a tealish quality. Might be a little bit bright, so let's take a bit of our black. So this way, now we've got black. Let's see, do I have any black left? A little bit, there we go. So that's going to turn this into a little bit more of a gray as opposed to a black or a white, right? And gray always has just a slightly different quality. Maybe that's... You know, I'm going to paint with this first, and then I'm going to add a little bit more warm blue into the mixture. I have my rag handy so that I can blend. Or, you know, again, you can use a paintbrush too. It does the same sort of effect. So in a way, I'm kind of like dry brushing with a glaze. Now, he, um, in terms of using oil paint, a different effect, different kind of approach, but I think we're kind of approximating a similar result. around just do a little bit more of this trying kind of keeping a sensitive eye to the area right around the canoe and not going too far too much Now I'm going to take a little bit more warm blue and put that in here.
You know, this kind of starts to remind me a little bit of like uh, Monet, right? And the water lilies and So I'm just going, digging into this paint, just taking a little bit of it, bring it into this mixture. Pulling the brush in the same area, so it's kind of it's just getting rid of the intensity of the brush stroke, you know, the the edges of it. I think that's probably and well do I want to do maybe just to take a little bit of uh, actually I'll just take some of this white right here mix it in I think there's just a few places where I want and then same sort of thing we'll just kind of bring them back Tense, so let's just walk that back just a bit. Okay, I think that's probably good enough. Um, okay, let's just clean these brushes up. And we'll go to another. So now what we're gonna do is just go to the foreground and finish up the canoe and the person. There's gonna be a little bit of ripples in the water, but we're getting very close to being done. So, um, so 
Let's look like we could get a bit darker blue there, but maybe we'll, we'll wait till we get a little bit more in there. That's why I always find it really difficult to, to just do one section and completely finish it, because usually, as I develop it, I realize, oh, I guess that should be darker now that I see this in place. And so I often have a lot of those kind of experiences. So let's put the uh, canoe in um, mostly with warm red. Maybe we'll take just a bit of, of warm yellow. I think I'm gonna rather. I'm just gonna use the br without any medium in it. Keep it kind of intense. And you see how all these, this is the paint that from before where I was kind of scrubbing it in and it overlapped on top of the canoe. Um, it actually kind of gives it this really cool quality now that we can kind of use. It gives it nuance in there. So again, just like the horizon, I think it's possible that, you know, I need to kind of look at this canoe from a little bit further away to see how straight it actually is. Let me see. Looks pretty good. Okay, let's keep on going then. Okay, I just put like a little drop of matte medium in here. Instead of using water, that matte medium just gives it a bit more fluidity. It'll allow me to kind of get this paint into some of the weave of the canvas here. Although I will add, it does look like he added a bit of white to clean that edge up. So I think we will do the same.
add a little bit more red later. But I think it's time to kind of zero in on the figure in these reflections. Also, it's worth noting that it's kind of strange that the this reflection is kind of orange when the figure in, on the top of the boat has nothing orange about him at all, right? What's that about? It's going to take a bit of green. Let's get our black. Do I need to mix more of it? Looks like I do. So black and warm red and cool, oh sorry, cool blue, cool, cool blue, cool yellow and warm red make our black, right? Looks a bit on the brownish side. That just tells me I need a little bit more cool blue. Okay, and then let's just take this and paint with this a little bit of a darker, kind of grainy uh, black, or kind of a reddish. Again, starting with not my with not black, but kind of a slightly lighter, more reddish color. I'm not sure exactly how he's getting that technique. If we really look in there, it's almost like a resist of some kind. He's Super dry brush. And a 
as I was smearing it, I got a bit of paint on the outside edge. Let's see if I can just wipe that away. There we go. Oh, that is really nice the kind of the waves he's got there I don't think I have time to get all of those little details in there though Now I'm just now I will take my black on its own and just a few little areas where I'll put that in. Remember, black wants to sit right at the very front of the painting, as close to us as possible. So that's why I really want to try to keep it as close to the front as possible, so that it keeps that, that illusion of space that we've been developing intact. Might be a little bit more I want to do in there. I could see it looks a little bit more green in his, but... So now I think it's time to do the figure, last but not least. Actually, let's just clean up. So the first thing I want to do is I want to mix this kind of skin tone. So I'm going to take my warm yellow and a little bit of warm red. In fact, that might be a bit much. This is a very pale skin tone. I'm going to add mostly white. Let's just see. Maybe just a little bit of blue. Or you can see how little bit of blue I'm talking about when I say blue. Slightly greenish quality to the skin here. A lot of paint on that brush, just wipe that off.
Okay. So I'm going to blow dry that. Yeah, bear bait says resist. Like, I, it's possible. Yeah, I think there's some sort of thing that he put in there that um, is obviously not gelling. It's kind of a. It's a very. I don't. I don't know enough about how he would have gotten the specific technique in the black for it to kind of just. Almost, yeah, it's, there's kind of like a resist, like a bit of like a wax resist or something. Maybe, I mean, that's entirely possible. He could have taken some like wax and just wiped it into those areas and then tried painting over top of it, which would, the areas where there's wax, the paint would just not stick to. So, um, that's possible. Anyway, uh, let's, I think we're just going to go right into the black. and do some little refinements. It's a little heavy-handed of an outline. I could come back with my skin tone and just narrow those lines up even more if I wanted. Sure, what's on that shirt? It is interesting how this shape kind of comes out in front of the the boat there a bit. So I'll do that too. And then just use my finger to wipe a bit of paint away, make that bit thinner. It's gonna take some white, kind of. I guess it's a bit of a turn. This a bit of a gray. Let's put a bit of that yellow actually in there. Yellowish gray for this beard. Bit of 
slightly greenish. to this face with my white. Does that look appropriately bizarre and creepy and weird enough? <laughs> okay. It's going to take the black and just add a bit more black. think just the last little thing that I want to do is he's got a little bit of white right along the edge of the canoe So, I think that's good enough. Okay, everyone, we're just about out of time here. So let's just take a look at how these paintings turned out side by side. 
As a reminder, if you found today's episode useful, interesting, humorous, click the like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can see future videos like this. Um, if you don't like it, just don't do anything at all. <laughs> Have a great day. Um, let your friends know about it. Take a photograph of the artwork you created. Join our Facebook group. Upload it to the Facebook group, and in a couple of weeks, we'll celebrate it together. We'll offer some feedback. If you want to leave a donation, there's a bunch of different ways you could do that, including the PayPal link in the description below, or you can contact me through the Facebook or my website. All those links are down below. Okay, so let's see how they turned out. Um, I feel pretty good about how these, these look side by side. You know, I, as always, there's always little things that I think I could improve on if I was to do it again, but I think we got everything that needs to be there, there. Uh, you know, as we z really zoomed in, we could see that there was a lot of extra complexity there that um, uh, one might not see when we're standing a little bit further away. But I think the gist of the painting is there. Some of the techniques he's using are there. How about we'll zoom in. We'll start up. Yeah, it's a little close. Maybe even still too close. Just looking. Actually, let's go in a bit more. I suppose. You know, again, you could see it's it's we don't have quite the same level of nuance that he does even in the figure down there. But I don't I'm not super bothered about that. I feel like for the scale that we're talking about, not bad. I think we got we nailed these colors pretty well down there. And the canoe. I mean, it's almost one of those things where I feel like I could spend a, a while just painting the reflection, and he did too. He redid this as as prints as well. I know prints are different than paintings, but I think you know what I mean. Okay, everyone, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, uh, wherever you are on a beautiful planet Earth. Thank you so much for joining me. It's Canada Day here in Canada, so we're celebrating that this today. Um, of course, there were people here in Canada for tens of thousands of years before the first Europeans came here. So it's just a, good just to recognize and acknowledge the first people that were here on Canada Day because... Uh, Canada as a country is fairly young, but the people that were here long, long, long before us um, uh, uh, have in many ways suffered um, over the course of the growth of our great nation, unfortunately. So I know there's some people that have very conflicted feelings about Canada today. Uh, so just worth just sort of um, acknowledging and, and being grateful, showing at the very least some gratitude uh, for those people, uh, our, our uh, indigenous brothers and sisters. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. We'll see you guys in a couple of days. Uh, I think we're doing one for um, American Independence Day, so we'll see you on Monday. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. I love you all. You're the best. We'll see you on the Facebook. Good night.